Hello and welcome to Inside Healthcare. One of the most common reasons that men and women seek emergency care is for stomach pain. So we've come to the urgency room in Egan to talk with Dr. Rob Anderson to some information about what do you do when you're having stomach pain and what are some of the causes mm -hmm. of it. So let's say you're having this stomach mm -hmm. pain and you don't know what you should do. What should people do? Yeah, well, if you're worried about it, certainly seek some care. Um, do some diagnostic testing. You know, we get worried. You can have, there's so many different things that can cause belly pain. The list is like this long, you know. What would be some of those things? Anywhere, you know, from the gallbladder, appendicitis, upset stomach, uh, blockage in the stomach. Um, so there's so many different things that can cause abdominal pain. People come in here all the time to the urgency room saying, what is this? I just don't know. And, you know, we can ask lots of more questions to each individual patient that comes in to try to determine what it is. And oftentimes just pressing on the tummy gives us a really good clue, you know, where is that pain localized to? Is there any um, other physical exam findings like guarding or rigidity or rebound tenderness? These are all signs that we can pick up on our exam that may clue us into what's going on. Mm -hmm. And if we're worried about those, then we have the ability to do the blood test here. We can even do the CAT scan and the ultrasound as well. So if somebody comes in with abdominal pain in the lower right quadrant, it's very classic for appendicitis. If you've had pain for a couple days, you don't want to eat or drink anything. It's tender when you press down here. We can do a blood test and a CAT scan or an ultrasound as well sometimes to see if you have appendicitis or not. And it should be, it could be something very serious. So you should, mm -hmm. you should not ignore it. I mean, mm -hmm. we all have stomach pains, I would think, from mm -hmm. one time to another, but. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes we all get a little bit of indigestion, mm -hmm. but I always say, you know, if, if that's lasting for a while, it's better to have it checked out. So what kinds of tests do you do, you do mm -hmm. here at the urgency room to kind of find out what it is causing that? Yeah, so we do blood tests oftentimes. So if somebody comes in with abdominal pain and we're worried about them, if their vital signs are abnormal, if their heart rate's abnormal, blood pressure's abnormal, or even sometimes when they are normal as well, we'll do a blood test to see if it's, you know, the gallbladder. What um, shows up in the blood test that would tell you that? That's well, you, your liver enzymes can okay. be off by a little bit. And we'll also look at the lipase, which is a blood test to see if you have pancreatitis, which is one of the organs in our body that can become inflamed and just causes this awful burning sensation. It just hurts like crazy right here. Sometimes people think they just have heartburn, but it turns out to be pancreatitis. And then um, there's some treatments that you can mm -hmm. offer them as well? Yep. For, so each of these different causes for abdominal pain, you know, if it's infected gallbladder, or infected appendix, appendicitis, you need to have surgery for those. So we can do all the testing here to determine if you have appendicitis. And we have good processes set up with different hospitals um, in the area, and we can arrange with a general surgeon, most commonly to just go straight to the operating room to have surgery. Oh, that quickly. Mm -hmm. So it, yeah, if it's you needed. can't ignore it, yeah. right? So um, final advice, like if someone's having stomach pain, yeah. what should they do? If you're having abdominal pain, if you're, if you're worried about it, if you have a fever, if it's just not going away, I'd certainly be seen for this. And we're coming to our viewers mm -hmm. from the urgency room. So again, for those not familiar with it, tell us a little bit about yeah. it. Yeah. So the urgency room, we're emergency medicine physicians, and we work here. Uh, we have a full staff here. We have a, a paramedic. We have an emergency medicine nurse. We have a, f a full lab. We have CT, ultrasound. We even do um, some fracture care. If somebody has a broken arm, we can do x-rays for that. Um, all sorts of things. You can do spinal taps if you think you have meningitis. Mm -hmm. um, I love working here. And they can come see Dr. Rob Anderson. Mm -hmm. yep. Yep. Yeah. Thanks for being here, Joey. Well, thank you. Appreciate it. We'll be back with more right after this. Chris Domine is a husband, father, and athlete because a kidney transplant gave him a second chance at life, made possible by an organ donor. Imagine what you could make possible. Learn more and sign up as a donor. Go to organdonor.gov. Welcome back to Inside Healthcare. Now we turn our attention to discussing mental health concerns during this Mental Health Awareness Month. As we first reported earlier this year, more firefighters die from suicide than in the line of duty. Here's a look at what the St. Paul Fire Foundation is doing to help those who help us. Firefighters are tasked with helping people that might be dealing with an emergency on the worst day of their lives. And it's something that firefighters are trained to be able to do. But over a career, 
dealing with people's emergencies day in and day out can take a toll on a firefighter. We need these guys to protect us, to help us. I, I don't know what we would do without them. It's an epidemic that people don't want to address. No one, <laughs> no one wants to admit they've got mental health issues. I've not wanted to admit it because in our culture it's weak. We have no shortage of people that say, I did, that doesn't affect me, it doesn't bother me. And I was one of those guys for a long time. They see some pretty Pretty bad stuff in their careers. A um, lot of uh, a lot of it has to do with with children, young adults, uh, and uh, it's often children uh, of the age of their own children, which can be particularly damaging to uh, first responders. And firefighters are no exception. Firefighters, every time they go out, they are walking into somebody else's worst day where we'd be asked to provide life-saving interventions or ultimately pronounce the victim deceased. So from um, jumpers to uh, gunshot, suicide. That and they are exposed sometimes to pretty grisly and horrific things as well occasionally. And that can sear itself into your memory and leave images and thoughts behind. Kids and, you know, it was the same spot we had done a rescue on the year before, the exact same spot in the bluffs. It's annoying you're going to go into work and put on all your USAR gear and start digging for a dead body it just is a really terrible evening. You see this stuff and you deal with this stuff on a daily basis. The disability gets louder and louder and, you, and you, you can't ignore it and it starts getting louder by causing problems in your personal life. You notice you're not sleeping. You know, so you might be drinking a lot more. Find yourself in, in a depression. The incidence of suicidal ideation is about 10 times higher in the EMS provider population than it is in the normal population. I'm concerned about that and uh, trying to do something about it. You know, losing three friends to suicide, knowing their families, knowing what it did to them, knowing what it did to, to me, my crew, and knowing that this is still going on. You can read it every day. I'm worried about the ones that can handle some of the trauma, but ultimately, over years of exposure to that, it weighs on them. They don't have good coping mechanisms. They're not sure what to do, and they feel lost, but they don't want to communicate because they're concerned that's a sign of weakness. So I want to provide avenues for people to go out and seek that help. The reality is that you don't always know what members are dealing with or struggling with. And so I think that alone makes me feel we have to be more proactive in getting out the information and making it acceptable to communicate and talk about our problems before they escalate to that extent. The legislature has taken some really positive steps in the, the presumptive uh, PTSD law. It's pretty much now accepted that the things we do and see are, are just accepted as contributors. Our job is accepted as a contributor to that. In fact, it was gone two minutes ago. Now it's back. And it's going away. It just, it comes and goes and comes and goes. Don't give up on them. They can, they're going through hell, literally. And uh, you have to, you have to help them find a way through the darkness. We need to take care of them too. They need to be taken care of.
Now we turn our attention to help for new moms experiencing mental health concerns during pregnancy and postpartum. Joining us to talk about this mental health issue and concern, we're pleased to have with us from PeriCare, Lisa Cross and Dr. Gassimi. So thank you for being with us. Thank, thank you. you for having us. So first of all, people might not be familiar with PeriCare. Can you just tell us a little bit about it and what you do? I'd be happy to do so. So PeriCare is a physician-led organization um, that primarily focuses on psychiatric care and mental health disorders. The vision and mission of the institution and prayer care as a whole is to really destigmatize uh, mental illness and uh, uh, common mottos that mental illness is common, it's real and it's treatable. Um, in I think that's the main message, yeah, that it is treatable. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. In particular, um, uh, prayer care has many levels of care for everyone in the family, so children, adolescents, and adults. And it makes um, natural sense to kind of be focused on moms and how they're doing and how that may impact their children and everyone else in the family and how we can best support them. Yeah. So when we're talking about some of these health concerns, mental health concerns, what are we talking about and how prevalent is it and at what stage before, during, or after pregnancy are you seeing women being affected by this? Typically, yeah, it typically happens within one in seven new moms um, or moms of subsequent pregnancies. Um, and we're, when we talk about the perinatal period, we're talking about um, the period during pregnancy and then a year postpartum. Right. So it can be at any stage that the, it mm -hmm. can happen. So what would be um, some of the symptoms of it and what causes it? So, yeah. you know, the things we think, so first of all, there's no single cause. It's multifactorial. Of so we course, think many yeah. um, things can be contributing to it. Um, one of the things to know about is the biological component can be the hormonal fluctuations that occur during pregnancy and the postpartum <clears throat> period can be contributing to it. But also um, taking on this new um, transition role can also contribute in the stressors that are associated with it. Um, it's important to not... Um, and any lack of social supports or aware of and additional stressors. But it's important to not to shame and guilt moms, but really it's, a, it's just where it, and moms tend to be higher risk during this time period for mood and anxiety disorders. And it, if you have a history of depression or anxiety prior to pregnancy or postpartum, that raises your risk level. So it's important to be vigilant for, um, regarding moms who may struggle with that. And that's why we want to take the shame and guilt out of it, but we want to be able to help support moms, screen moms early, and try to get them the help they need. It seems like, yeah, we, we hear more about it now, especially maybe a celebrity, a celebrity who's been, yeah. you know, dealing with it, coping with it and stuff. So that is helping to raise that awareness and that it's something that can be treatable and not to be shamed about. So symptoms, can they be masked by other symptoms or can it be just brought on by a the lack of sleep and, and the stress of the pregnancy itself? Yeah, symptoms a lot of times are very confusing for moms and for providers because it's not, mm -hmm. when we talk about depression and anxiety, we think more generalized depression and anxiety versus perinatal okay. depression and anxiety. And the way that it differs is that oftentimes we see it um, appear with agitation, irritability, um, so oftentimes if moms are feeling like they're not themselves, that they're more irritable, mm -hmm. they are yelling at their spouse or their partner a little bit more, or yelling at other children um, a little bit more often, that that can be a sign that when you're not feeling like yourself, that there's something that needs to be addressed and to talk with your provider about that. Um, I think that there's a lot of confusion too of when this can occur and so oftentimes not understanding that it can happen during pregnancy um, and that postpartum it can happen anywhere within that first year. So mm -hmm. sometimes we'll get moms who have an eight month old and say, well, I can't be postpartum because I've had my baby for yeah, eight months. I was months. wondering like how long, it can last for quite a long time sometimes, yeah. right? Absolutely. So it can, as Lisa said, it can last up to the first year postpartum, um, so um, after the baby's born, and if not treated, even longer beyond that. So I think it's really important to recognize early on. Um, um, in addition to that, we know from the science and literature that if mom is um, untreated, so her perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, which includes depression, anxiety, postpartum, um, um, excuse me, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, oh. as well as OCD, bipolar disorders, and um, psychosis, which is an emergency. Um, 
this can have not only impact on negative impact on mom, but it can also have long-term impacts on the developing infant and child. So it's really important to kind of address this and, and, and treat it sooner rather than later because it's not just mom that's affected, but also baby and the whole family. And can it happen if you have multiple births, like didn't happen with the first one, but maybe it's not happening yes. with another one? Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. So it can hit a first time mom, it could hit a mom who's had multiple babies, it can hit women that are breastfeeding, women that are not breastfeeding, so it really is important to be vigilant. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just gonna say there's confusion as well about um, with, we always use the term postpartum depression, and there are subcategories of, of other disorders that fall into this as well. So if a mom is feeling like, well, I'm having a lot of anxiety or I'm being very hypervigilant about my child or about my own health, mm -hmm. they feel like, well, I'm not sad, I'm not depressed, I don't fall into that category, I don't have postpartum depression. So we really wanna look at all the various different spectrums that are within that. And also understanding too that we tend to see either an either or, either they're pulling away from the infant and detaching, uh -huh. um, not bonding, or they're hypervigilant towards the infant and um, being kind of what is categorized as a helicopter mom. Um, and there's a lot of shame and guilt that's involved with both of those mm -hmm. for mothers. And there is help available. Why don't you tell us about some of the help that's available and then specifically with um, the Prairie Care, you have a what do you call it, outpatient? Intensive, intensive outpatient, outpatient program, program. absolutely. Yeah, so so um, thank you so much for asking. So we do have, um, there is help available, it is treatable. So we have a uh, perinatal intensive outpatient program. Um, and our focus of the program is to kind of um, not only provide an individual um, um, treatment to moms, but also incorporate the whole family system. So. Um, in our program, moms can bring in their infants, and so one of the th uh, therapeutic interventions we'll be doing is improving mom and baby's bonding, and how the um, and that we know is overall improves baby's outcome as well as mom's. Um, also, we'll um, have uh, interventions to improve skill sets for mom to manage um, um, depression, anxiety, mood, etc. One of the things that's gonna be unique about our program is we're really gonna shore up the um, support for mom and the whole family system. So I think incorporating partners, um, having family therapy be a part of it, as well as um, addressing the whole family system, kind of this idea that mom is just not the only person struggling, but having helping her be greater supported, greater education. Um, our program will have um, several days of programming, so it's a little bit more than what you would get if you were just doing your traditional Hence outpatient. Intensive, yeah. yeah, yeah. So a few days of programming um, uh, for about ten to one, and it'll be broken up with um, with a break in between. Um, Lisa will be leading a lot of the um, education, but we'll have um, in terms of uh, what's going on, but also process for moms. So really help moms and be empowered to kind of transition to the next step. Um, our goal is to really help moms and families kind of get back on track to, and because it's a, it's a challenging time and we could address this with um, um, medications, with ther specific therapies that we mm -hmm. know that are helpful and that um, also make sure we have a good plan for mom after the fact. So mom is, goes from our program to the next step and continues to work and get better. It's got to be rewarding though to see the results when they've gone through this and things are much better for them and the family. Yeah. Absolutely. So, yeah. Absolutely. So um, can they just come to Prairie Care? Do they need to go to their primary care physician or um, pro professional before they come see you? Or Yeah, they can do either it? one. So we were set up to where either provider can call and get mom set up or mom herself can call. Um, we know that oftentimes moms are looking for resources in the middle of the night when they're awake with of course, baby. Yeah, it's always in the middle of the night. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? Yeah. and their provider's not available. So if they want to reach out to us at that time, um, then we call them back right away in the morning and get them set up to either do an assessment with myself or Dr. Sugar Baker is another one of our um, psychiatrists in the program. Um, so the two of us are doing intakes for these moms and getting them started within the program as as soon as we possibly can because yeah. we know that their issues are urgent and that they need help right away. And you do free health assessments for other um, mm -hmm. conditions as well, right? Right, Mental exactly. Health conditions. So, um, one of the um, missions of Prairie Care is to make sure to get people um, uh, hopefully connected with resources. And so we do. Um, we have a free needs assessment available 
to folks who um, have other disorders too, or kids, adolescents, and adults who may be struggling and figuring out what, what level of care is appropriate for them. So if they want more information, they can go to your website and the phone number? That Absolutely. So they can the go to our website. We have a phone number yeah. they can call. Um, um, and they can get a, our nurse from the, our team who is a former NICU nurse who can uh, help take their information and kind of direct them to the right resource. Our goal is to try and get mom seen within a week. Wow, that's, so we that's get wonderful. What quick. a great goal. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's been wonderful to have you with us. We really thank appreciate you. it. I know you're very busy, so thank you for your time. Thank you so thank much you. for having us. Can I do a little um, shout quickly. out for Lisa? Um, so she was an author of a bill that was recently passed through the legislature. Oh, and yeah. it's uh, waiting um, to be signed by the governor. And it's to make uh, May um, officially um, Maternal Mental Health Month to really kind of raise that awareness. Well, wonderful. So really well, thank you her. for doing that. Yeah, and, yeah. Thank you. And thank you again for being with us. Thank you. We'll thank be you. back with more right after this. Stay with us. Did you go tanning? You're getting so tan. We need some sun. Protect yourself. Protect your friends. Stop tanning. Learn more at spotskincancer.org. Finally, help for new moms to get physically back in shape after having a baby. And we're pleased to have with us Carly Chase um, Jacobus, and she is a postpartum coach. And um, before we get into the coach, um, what, why is it so hard for new moms to get back in shape after having a baby? There's a lot of things that happen during pregnancy that are really unique and don't happen any other time, especially that separation of abdominal muscles. When you're pregnant, the baby's growing and your uterus is getting bigger. Your abs have to separate to allow room. And so it's hard to get back from that and be able to strengthen those muscles again, as well as there's other imbalances that happen during pregnancy. And you were telling me before we started that your background was in um, a physical fitness and, and helping yeah. that way. So that kind of led into what you're doing now? Yeah. Helping so, new moms? <laughs> exactly. Um, I got my bachelor's degree in exercise physiology from the University of Wisconsin Eau Claire and I've been working in fitness now for eight years. I've worked with lots of different populations all the way from children to athletes to people with Alzheimer's and dementia and now I've been working with postpartum moms. And you do this um, on social media. Why don't you tell mm -hmm. us about it, and, you know, your consulting business then? And, yeah, yeah, and so I works. got started kind of using Instagram and Facebook with the postpartum coach, and that's my way that I can post exercises and connect with new moms. They can ask me questions, and it's a really good way to be interactive even through social media. Which so do you easy. physically showing them things that, that you can do mm -hmm. as well as consulting part of it? Yeah, so I do a lot of videos of different exercises that they can do at home and they can do when baby is sleeping and get themselves back to being active again. So what would be something someone that might be watching this right now that they could do whether they're um, on their couch or if they're um, you know just on their computer and stuff like that? What would what would be a tip or two that you can give share with them? Yeah. Well, the biggest change, I think, is in your core and learning how to retrain your abdominal muscles after they've been stretched and weakened. So my best tip I can give for new moms is learning how to engage that core. And you can do that anywhere at your home. We can do it sitting right here in the chair. Mm -hmm. So if you sit nice and straight with a neutral spine and think about squeezing your core in and up. I like to say, bring your belly button to your spine and up into your rib cage. And as you do this, exhale all your air. And you should feel a squeezing. I think of my abs actually squeezing together. It's working those deep abdominal muscles and that's what's gonna bring your abs back together and help strengthen after and having baby. How often would you have to do that? And um, repeated times or like sessions? Yeah, I, I like to say try and do you know, 10 sets of the breathing in and out, squeezing on the exhale, and repeat it as often as is comfortable for you. Sometimes when you first have the baby, it can be a little challenging, so. So is that the same kind of thing like when you're doing sit-ups, except, or maybe even yeah. planks? Yeah, exactly. Um, 
And it's getting you back to being able to do those kind of exercises. Because when your abs are separated, you actually don't want to start doing sit-ups and planks. Because it's, <laughs> it's a <laughs> little too much. Does anyone want to do them anytime? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, and those muscles that you use, especially in a sit-up, those are actually damaged. So this is working the ones underneath that that will be able to get you back to doing sit-ups. <laughs> and how long would it take before you're going to see some results doing that then? I mean, if you're... If you do it every day, you can see results in a few weeks and slow improvement, but you can start noticing those abs coming back together. You'll feel less back pain and feeling strengthened. What would be another tip that we would share with our viewers? Yeah, so another one is uh, your hips tend to get really weak. So I like to actually tell new moms they can do chair squats so I can demonstrate right here. Okay. Oh, wait, you do have a mic on. I do have a mic on. <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, if you would stand up from the chair, when you sit down, making sure that core is strong and squeezing your glutes sitting into the chair, you can start doing that and get yourself back to doing regular well, Those would squats. be really simple to do then. Yeah, it's a good thing to do at home. So if someone is interested in um, talking to you or getting some information, how do they go about doing that? Yeah, so you can find me on my social media at The Postpartum Coach, and that's on Facebook or Instagram. I also have a website, and that's bestafterbaby.com. So they can go there, or they can email me at carly at bestafterbaby.com. It's got to be rewarding, though, as I was talking with the doctor earlier, when they're helping young moms, new moms, also deal with their issues. But to be able to help someone get back in shape, and yeah, yeah. it's got to be exciting to see that happen. Yeah, I, I love working with new moms, and they'll start saying, oh, I feel stronger, I feel more like myself, and it just seeing that is so great. <laughs> yeah, that's the key, being strong and healthy. Yeah. And, and anything dietarily that they should be also adding, you know, during this to help improve, like, their get more out of their exercises and stuff? Yeah, so the big thing that I teach with the diet is just watching portion control. I don't teach any specific diets. There's Eating is so individualized, so I don't say, oh, you have to eat this and this. I just give them amounts. So I say, watch your portion control. Some people like to count calories. Some people even just like to take a picture of their food every time before they eat. It helps them think about what they're eating. Oh, so, I hadn't thought about that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and so eating what you enjoy, but just in moderation. Well, final comments for our viewers. Yeah, well, I mean, the two biggest things I say to new moms is it takes time. So <laughs> being patient, patient, yep, it can be really disheartening and it's hard when you've gained weight and you feel weak and you don't feel like yourself. So it takes nine months to make a baby and it takes that or longer to get back. And you're talking but, also from experience yourself. Correct. You're a fairly new mom yourself then. Yeah, my son is four months and <laughs> I've... It's, now I'm finally starting to feel like myself and be able oh, to do the exercises you. I used to do. Well, it's been yeah. a pleasure to have you on the show with us. Yeah, so thank thanks you, so Carly. much for having me. Yeah. And um, I'm sure all the new moms are very grateful to have you available yeah. as well. So it's yeah. nice to be able to offer that to them. So thanks. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. So and we'd like to thank you for joining us. We hope you'll join us next time on Inside Healthcare. We'll see you then, everyone.